Turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11. This is Memorial Day weekend, and I had been really up through in part of this week. I really been anticipating just sticking with our series through Proverbs, but uh, then the Lord just um, directed me another way and and brought to mind a soldier in the Bible, a soldier who made a sacrifice. So the message tonight is not going to be so much on the, the, the entire story, the whole events of the story, but I want to focus on the soldier himself. And that's in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we begin reading at verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an even tide, evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and to tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk, and at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass, when Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also. A soldier's sacrifice. Uh, the, uh, an example here in Scripture of a sacrifice that was made, Uriah. I realize the uh, circumstances surrounding his death. It was not just simply, well, he went out to battle and, uh, and, and just things, you know, things were certainly set up to make his death more and more likely. But the fact was he was a soldier who made a sacrifice in battle. And that's the focus here of the message tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we can be here this evening and uh, look into your word. And I pray that you bless the preaching of your word. And may we um, uh, both uh, see uh, the characteristics of a soldier and the sacrifices that are made, but also take heart, apply things to our lives as well as you guide and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a, I have a VA report on military deaths in America's wars. And um, the, first of all, I read, I don't know if I'll read all of these, but uh, I'll read at least, at least some of these. But American Revolution, which was from 1775 to 1783, uh, there were a total of 217, now these are the numbers the VA is giving, uh, 217,000 total service members. Now it says here, footnote says exact number is unknown. 
Uh, and that posted figure is the median of estimated range from 184,000 to 250,000. So uh, just as an estimation, 217,000. But uh, battle deaths in the uh, American Revolution, 4,435. And it gives also the number of the injured, but I'll just, I guess, for sake of time, focus on the deaths. Uh, the War of 1812, from 1812 to 1815, total of 286,000. 730 service members with 2,260 battle deaths. And uh, the Indian Wars, approximately 1817 to 1898, a, a VA estimate of 106,000 service members and 1,000 battle deaths. The Mexican War, 1846 to 1848, a total of 78,718 service members, uh, 1,733 battle deaths, but other deaths in the theater of battle uh, that weren't directly battle related but still in the process of being in battle, 11,550. The Civil War, was uh, that was a big one, uh, 1861 to 1865, and really in some ways one of the saddest events in our nation's history. Uh, total U.S. service members in the Union, 2,213,363. Total uh, battle deaths for the Union, 140,414 other deaths in theater, 224,097. Total service members for the Confederates, 1,050,000, uh, which would be a, uh, uh, once again, the median of the estimated range. And uh, battle deaths, uh, once again, incomplete numbers, but uh, an estimated 74,524, along with other deaths of 59,297. Spanish-American War, 306, uh, that was from 1898 to 1902, 306,760 with 385 battle deaths and 2,061 other deaths in service, uh, which says non-theater. And then World War I, 1917 to 1918, total U.S. service members worldwide was 4,734,991 with 53,402 battle deaths and other deaths in service totaling 63,114. Uh, this one, there, was, there were over 204,000 non-mortal woundings. And then uh, World War II, 1941 to 1945, uh, a total of 16,112,566 total U.S. service members worldwide 291,557 battle deaths and 113,842 other deaths in service non-theater and then 670,846 non-mortal woundings and then uh, the estimate at this point it says living veterans 1,711,000 is what it says uh, at this point it says estimate based upon new population projection methodology so not sure how they come up with those numbers, but uh, that's what it says here. And this, this is probably a couple of years old, possibly this document, but uh, Korean War, 1950 to 1953, a total of 5,720,000 U.S. service members worldwide. Total serving in theater, 1,789,000. And then 33,739 battle deaths. Other deaths in theater, uh, almost 3,000 and other deaths in service, 17,672. Non-mortal woundings, 103,284, with living veterans numbering 2,275,000. And then the Vietnam War, 1964 to 1975, total of the U.S. service members uh, from, the, uh, from 64 to the date of the ceasefire in 73. 8,744,000. The number deployed to Southeast Asia is 3,403,000 with 47,434 battle deaths, almost 11,000 other deaths in theater, and 32,000 uh, other deaths in service non-theater with 7,391,000 living veterans. Desert Shield and Desert Storm, 1990-1991, the number of the total U.S. service members worldwide, 2,322,000, 2, with 694,550 
deployed to the Gulf with 148 battle deaths, 235 other deaths in theater, and 1,565 other deaths in service, non-theater, 467 non-mortal woundings with, according to this, 2,244,583 living veterans from that time period. And then they give the uh, total wars from 19, 1775 to 1991, U.S. military service during wartime, 41,892,128 with 651,031 battle deaths, 308,800 other deaths in theater, and other deaths in service non-theater, 230,254. Non-mortal woundings totaling 1,430,290. Uh, along with um, living veterans, periods of war and peace, 23,234,000. And they don't give numbers for the global war on terror starting October of 2001, which is basically the never-ending war. And, uh, and so they, they, they give a link for the Department of, uh, Department of Defense website as to those numbers. And why do I read all that? What's the purpose of that? Well, it's good to remember. Uh, I didn't know this document was out there. I just found this. And uh, they give these numbers. And it's good to remember that's the purpose of Memorial Day is remembering the sacrifice of the, uh, those who have served, who have given their lives for the sake of our nation. And uh, it's, you think about those, just the sheer numbers. Number one, just the number of people serving total in our nation. It's no surprise that the military is a big deal. The armed forces of the United States is a big deal to people because it touches so many lives, affects so many lives. And then also, then when you think of the number injured, you think of the number uh, that have been killed uh, in battle, killed in other ways, um, that is a, a very significant uh, number of people, many lives touched, and is certainly good to remember. And so in, by way of remembering tonight, we should remember another soldier's sacrifice in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And there's three things here that I see in this passage that uh, Uriah, the Hittite, sacrificed in his life as a soldier. First of all, it was a sacrifice of time. He, he gave a sacrifice of time. And I want to parallel this with the sacrifices that soldiers still make today, soldiers in this nation make today. But he gave a sacrifice of time. Uh, the, we're not going into all the details of this story, uh, a lot of times in this particular story, for the focus is on David and Bathsheba and all the, the, the whole circumstance surrounding that. And for the most part, as, as far as the longevity of, the, of what the Bible says about it, that is the focus of that account. But it's also important to see a little bit about Uriah. We don't see a lot about Uriah, but we do see some things about him in this passage, uh, that he was a good soldier. He was an honorable soldier. And he, he gave a, uh, made a sacrifice of his time. Now, how did he make a sacrifice of his time? Well, first of all, he made a sacrifice of his time simply by his service. And, of course, in some uh, nations, uh, for example, um, you know, Israel and other places, you know, there may be compulsory military service. And when you had kings, I mean, you know, if the king called you to battle, you were going to battle. But, uh, uh, you know, and I'm thankful for the volunteer military force we have. Uh, today in our nation, we've we've had. I, I'm I'm all for that having a volunteer um, uh, force and 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 allow people to go out of the uh, just the great desire of their heart that they that they just believe they've got that calling. They, it's their mission they want to serve, and I think that's a great opportunity for people to have. And so I'm thankful for those who actually volunteer, who who have volunteered. Now I'm not necessarily always in favor, and many times not in favor of all the conflicts and things that our government gets entangled in and intervention in affairs of other nations. But that does not, whether, no matter what you think about interventions in other nations, um, that doesn't change the attitude we should all have toward our servicemen and women uh, that, uh, that have sacri that sacrificed their time. You know what? Life is what? It's time. Our life consists of time. And when someone goes into battle, or, or at least someone goes and joins the armed forces, maybe not into battle, but many have, uh, they are sacrificing their time. They could be doing something else with their life. And here, 
Uriah was no different. He sacrificed his time. Now, he you know, may not have had a choice in the fact that he was serving in the, uh, in the armed forces, but uh, in, their, in, their, in their army here uh, in uh, David's time as the king. But he was sacrificing his time. And what's he doing with his time? Down in verse 6, it says, And David sent to Joab. Now, this is after David and Bathsheba are together. He takes Bathsheba to himself and, and uh, commits adultery with her. And she uh, finds out she's expecting a child. And so David's putting forth this plan that he's going to try to cover this up pretty easily. Or at least he thinks he's going to cover this up pretty easily. And David sent to Joab, verse 6, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. So now he's taking his time to go. He's leaving the battle and he's now taking his time to go before the king as, as was requested of him. And so that is, those are days of his life. Those are hours of his life. And so once again, you say, well, he was told to come before the king. I understand that, but that still is a sacrifice of one's time. That he, you know, he didn't run away. He didn't go off into some uh, other place or try to get out of it. He was just there doing his duty, serving the king, serving their uh, country. And so there's a sacrifice of time. In verse 8, And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. You know, when someone's a soldier, it takes time. It takes time, and we should not take that for granted in the lives of soldiers today, the time that they spend, uh, oftentimes at expense of their families, if they have a family, uh, the time that is taken in the service of our country. Second thing here is that a soldier of a soldier's sacrifice, and particularly Uriah here, but also soldiers today, there's a sacrifice of pleasure. Now, uh, from what I understand, I've never been in the military, but uh, from what I understand, uh, soldiers today, they still find plenty of ways to find their pleasure. And, uh, you know, Russ could probably attest to that better than, uh, better than I can, that, you know, even in, even in the military, there's still, a sacri- uh, there's still a finding of pleasure in different ways. Now, it's not always godly pleasure, uh, but uh, people are still looking for pleasure in the military. But, you know, there are pleasures they do have to give up. There are pleasures, the normal everyday things that we might be able to enjoy that they don't get to enjoy. For example, those who are serving. And and even I think of uh, someone we know in Connecticut who's in the Connecticut National Guard. He spent a couple of uh, times over overseas just on, you know, just in in, in more in generally more peaceful areas. As far as I know, Uh, one was in Kosovo and another one. I don't remember his other the other place, maybe not quite as good as Kosovo, but um, but uh, anyway, you know, but he sacrificed time and he also sacrificed pleasure. He was apart from his wife for that time and his children and, uh, and you know, missing, I'm sure, holidays and, and time with family and, and those types of things. There's a sacrifice of pleasure that uh, takes place in the life of a soldier. Uh, and thankfully, his, I think his second go round now here is done. He's back, just got back, I think, this past, in this past month, uh, which is a great thing for his uh, his family, and I think he might have taken his wife. I saw this on Facebook, actually. I think he took his wife to some Caribbean island or some Caribbean nation. I think they're taking a vacation, so they're getting their pleasure in now. Um, but anyway, but there is a sacrifice of pleasure. All those months, his, his wife is, is having to take care of their children herself. And, of course, they, they do have some family who helps, but he's not there. The father is not there. And so there's a sacrifice of time. There's a sacrifice of pleasure. And so in verse 8, look at what Uriah does, his sacrifice of pleasure. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. So what was he telling him? He says, Go to your house, wash your feet. In other words, you go to your house, get ready for bed, have a good night of sleep, you know, go be with your wife. And then, he, and then apparently the king's going to hear, have a nice feast, have some good food. Look at what in verse 9, what he does. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and went not down to his house. Now, in this case, the king's telling him to do something. He's telling him to go, you know, go enjoy the time with your wife. Go enjoy time at home. And, you know, of course, David is trying to set this thing up to cover up his own sin. But, you know, this time Uriah is choosing to sacrifice pleasure. 
He's choosing to sacrifice going to his own home, going to his own bed, going to be with his own wife. And why does he do that? Verse 10, And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to, to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Got the bug. A little gnat fly type of thing flying around here. I got him. Uh, he made a sacrifice for sure. Um, but he says, you know, the... Well, everybody else is out there in the fields. They're not home with their wives. The ark is out there and all these things. And so well, how can I do this? He says, I will not do this thing. Now you could say, you know, he was disobeying a direct order from the king. But what was leading him to do that? It was his honor as a soldier saying, no, I just cannot do this because of all these other ones. I don't want this special privilege and this, these extra pleasures, because there's still things going on out there. And so Uriah was sacrificing pleasure in doing these things. So David gives him another chance. Verse 12, And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And that even when he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. So he tried it again. Uh, he ate and drank before it made him drunk. And he's trying to do whatever he can to get him to go to his own house with his own wife to cover up his own sin. And yet he went not down to his house. He did not go. And once again, sacrificing pleasure. Now David's trying to give him pleasure, the king. He's trying to make that there. Here's a feast, here's drink, here's, here are these things. And uh, he wouldn't do it. He would not do it. And so that, of course, set David, if you know the story, David then has to shift to another option of how he's going to cover his sin, or at least try to cover his sin. And that would be by arranging... Uriah to be killed. And that leads to number three, the sacrifice of a soldier is a sacrifice of life. So there are times, you know, time is one thing to sacrifice. Pleasure is another thing, but there are times when soldiers need to sacrifice their lives. And any soldier who goes into conflict recognizes the possibility that they might not come out of it alive. And certainly Uriah and the other ones there in that army uh, they would uh, probably have thought the same thing. They knew. They knew death was a reality. That's what they're in the middle of uh, in the battle. And Uriah did make a sacrifice of his life. Verse 14, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. So put him where the worst of the fighting is, the hardest of the fighting and then, at, you know, when he's not realizing it, just back off and he'll just be a sitting duck out there and he'll die. And that was what a, uh, was certainly a low point, a dark time in David's life. David, the man after God's own heart, not a good time in David's life. But with Uriah, here he is unwittingly, he's sacrificing his own life, even by his own hand, taking the letter, delivering it back to Joab. In verse 16, And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. In other words, uh, the ones that were the most likely to put up the hardest, uh, most fierce battle. And so he's looking, all right, where can I put Uriah? And he puts him over there. And this, this uh, just a, a you know, very dastardly, underhanded, uh, and ungodly plan that David had set forth and Joab participates in. And verse 17, And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. And then later on, David gets the report that men have died, and Uriah was one of them. Oh, you know, well, death happens in war. I mean, well, that just happens. But then 
He goes and he takes Bathsheba to be his wife. And it is worth noting, this message is not about uh, David so much, but look at verses 26 and 27. When the right wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. And this, this phrase, there are times, for some reason, this phrase is just seared in my mind, this sentence. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the reason that sticks out to me is you have this entire narrative, this entire story of uh, this account of, of what happened with David and Uriah and Bathsheba. And at the very end of the chapter, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So even though David puts forth his plan, God was still watching all of this. He was keeping track of all this and was displeased. Once again, that's not the message tonight, but that just sticks out to me uh, so much. Uh, in, in, when it comes to pleasing and displeasing the Lord. And even though David thought he had accomplished what he set out to do to cover his sin, and later on in chapter 12, uh, that sin gets found out. And David does confess. But the focus back on Uriah is he did make the sacrifice of his life. Now there's another kind of soldier that uh, makes these sacrifices. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. There's certainly the soldier Uriah who, who made a sacrifice of his time, his pleasure, and ultimately his life. And then there are soldiers today and in our nation's history who make the sacrifice of time, the sacrifice of pleasure, and uh, sacrifice of life. But you know, there are, there are spiritual sacrifices, uh, spiritual soldiers, I should say, who make sacrifices. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Actually, let me go back um, verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, the direct connection here is with those that are specifically in the ministry, such as Timothy, a pastor. He says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. What do you see here? You see sacrifice. No man, so a spiritual soldier, a soldier of the Lord, no man that warreth gets into that spiritual battle. Whether, and I'll say the context here is, uh, the, I think there's a direct connection here to those that are in the ministry, such as pastors. But you know, I, I, I believe the application can be made to anybody who wants to serve the Lord, any Christian who's committed to serving the Lord and living for the Lord, is in a spiritual battle. You're a soldier of the Lord. And it says here that no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Now think about when someone enlists in the armed forces today, there are certain affairs of this life that they have to untangle themselves from and dedicate themselves wholly to what they are involved in what their, their, their training, their, their mission, their, uh, the execution of that mission, their service. And so there are things that soldiers have to forego. You know, I would not want, uh, let's just say, um, you know, I, I would not want uh, our nation's military, our soldiers going out into battle with just kind of a you know, laissez-faire attitude and just, uh, you know, well, whatever happens, happens. You know, just whatever will be, will be. And que sera, sera. And, uh, no, you want somebody who's trained, who has a mission, who's competent, who's skilled, who knows what they're doing. And so it is in the ministry as well. We need Christians. Well, first, we need pastors. We need Christians of all, whether pastors or not, who, are, who know what they're doing, who are trained, who are being trained, who are equipped to fight the spiritual battles. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. And what's the purpose? That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You know, God calls people into, uh, you could say, if you want to say, quote unquote, full-time ministry, whether it's pastor, missionary, that full-time uh, service in that, in that way, formally. You know, any Christian is, should be full-time serving the Lord, living a life of service to the Lord. But I also like what uh, one preacher said in, in reference to this verse. 
He said we need to declutter our lives of things that have no eternal value. I, I like that phrase in reference to this verse. We need to declutter our lives of things that have no eternal value. What really is going to count for the Lord and what doesn't count for the Lord? What is hindering us? What is blocking our ability to effectively serve the Lord, to accomplish the mission that He has called us to? Let me just read this here by, uh, probably close with this by Albert Barnes. I like the, what he said about it is that it, that is him who has enlisted him or in whose employ he is in, in reference to that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. His great object is to approve himself to him. It is not to pursue his own plans or to have his own will or to accumulate property or fame for himself. His will is absorbed in the will of his commander and his purpose is accomplished if he meet with his approbation. Nowhere else is it so true that the will of one becomes lost in that of another, as, is in the case, as in the case of the soldier. In an army it is contemplated that there shall be but one mind, one heart, one purpose, that of the commander, and that the whole army shall be as obedient to that as the members of the human body are to the one, that controls, to the one will that controls all. The application of this is obvious. The grand purpose of the minister of the gospel is to please Christ. He is to pursue no separate plans and have no separate will of his own. And it is contemplated that the whole core, quote, core of Christian ministers and members of the churches shall be as entirely subordinate to the will of Christ as an army is to the orders of its chief. Do you want to effectively wage a good warfare? Just like Uriah, just like modern day soldiers in, in our nation's military, there does require, it does require a sacrifice of time. It does require at times a sacrifice of pleasure. Now we recognize as believers the, the true pleasures are at God's right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. But the things that perhaps other people in the world can go out and do and may not be sinful themselves, but they, they go out and do these pleasure things. When it comes to serving the Lord, there are times we make sacrifices of pleasure. You know what? Well, I just can't do this. I have other priorities or this just is not for me. Uh, and then there's also a sacrifice of life that if we're going to commit ourselves to the spiritual battle, it does require a whole lifelong commitment to living for the Lord and fighting those spiritual battles and being in His service. There is a requirement of that if we're going to wage a good warfare. There are sacrifices involved. Now we know from a spiritual perspective, from an eternal perspective, in, in light of eternity, it is not a sacrifice, really, spiritually speaking. But we're humans. We live in a world with we live in the this world. And so from an earthly perspective, it is a sacrifice. It is there are sacrifices that are made for the sake of living for the Lord. What is that to you? What, what aspect of your time, your pleasure, and your life still is not surrendered to the Lord in His service? And just as Uriah has made a sacrifice and these hundreds and hundreds of thousands of soldiers, American soldiers, have made the ultimate sacrifice with their life, what sacrifice do we need to make as a good soldier of Jesus Christ? What are we still entangling ourselves with in this life, in this world, that is hindering ourselves from waging a good warfare. I can, I, I, and I think each of us, we, we probably know ourselves pretty well, at least well enough that perhaps in the moment when those times come, we know what those things are. I mean, I can tell you, I know exactly what things hinder me from warring a good warfare. Does that mean I always detangle myself from them? No, unfortunately it doesn't, but God always gives me a reminder I always have the realization, you know what, I'm not, I'm not in a position to fight a spiritual battle with, with this in my life and doing this. And so we know that. I think you know that. If you just let the Lord work in your life, speak to you about those things, of what areas would hinder you from warring a good warfare. So let's remember this Memorial Day on this uh, Memorial Day weekend of the sacrifice of the soldiers of our nation in gratefulness and commemoration. Remember the sacrifice of Uriah, who was a good soldier for David, and then also have ourselves surrendered to the service of the Lord.